Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. And I told you all this morning that we would be introducing our ESU co-branded co items. And I'm showing you one of them, which is our ESU mask. And this is something we don't relish, but we think it's important. And if it keeps you safe and it keeps everyone you love safe and your family safe, we're gonna do it and we're gonna put our name on it. So as you saw, when we entered the session, you saw all this, the co-branded merchandise that's now going to be available to you in this centennial year. We suggest you visit the site and see what we have to offer. And one of the items is our mask. Anyway, I wanna welcome everybody this afternoon to this event. It was about a year ago, almost a year ago that we all came together in Washington DC at the AGM. And, we, and you met with Martin Tipping for the first time. And at that point, we were talking about setting the stage for our centennial in the next 100 years and our new logo. And a lot has happened since then. We did what we planned to do, but a lot else has happened in the long run. And um, I think that one of the things that came out of that event was the notion of stories and 100 years, 100 stories. And we felt that an organization that had such a background had a lot of stories to tell. So we started to, to pull them together and we'll see a little bit on, on Wednesday at the gala. But we wanna continue this into the next six months. We wanna to continue to gather these stories because one of the reality of our lives is, is that we can't come together in the festive way that we had hoped we would, but we can come together with regard to telling our stories. And stories at this particular time can be very important and they can be very healing. So I'd like to now introduce you to people who don't know Martin and those of you who do know Martin, bringing him back so we could speak with him again or see him again is Martin Tipping from Ogis and Company. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, let me um, put my... Oh. What are you, are you seeing my full screen? There you go. Bear with me one second. Um, I'm just gonna stop sharing and share my screen again.
There we go. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it is a, a pleasure to be with you all um, virtually um, at uh, tea time. Um, so I have my cup of tea. I hope everybody has uh, a cup of tea ready for them. Uh, we're going to talk about um, storytelling um, in the time that we have today. And um, I'm going to tell you some stories and I'm going to um, invite you to participate um, at various points in the presentation. Um, so um, for those of you who are familiar with Zoom, um, at certain points in the um, in, in this session, um, I'll ask you to um, type um, into the Q&A or the chat um, section, um, put um, enter just some, some information and uh, share um, some thoughts and ideas. So we're talking about story. And so I thought what better place um, to talk about story than by sharing a story um, with you. Um, and this is the story, um, I guess in a way it's the story of my grandmother, but it's also my story. And so I sort of start by introducing you to my grandmother um, who, um, this is her in her later years, um, looking very regal. Um, and she ran a um, toy store in um, Leeds in Northern England. Now, before you get very excited and say, wow, my grandmother ran the Harrods of toys. Um, this is Leeds City Market. So the actual toy store itself, um, well, the market is a beautiful building. This is what the toy store looked like. Not quite as glamorous, not quite um, the Harrods of toy stores um, that you might expect. It was a little market stall. Um, and I used to work with her um, in the summers selling sunglasses and toys. And uh, the gentleman who, um, this was a few years back, I went back to Leeds and there was still a toy store there. This was the gentleman running it now. But I used to sit in that exact spot um, selling toys. And the reason I wanted to share my grandmother's story is the reason she started this toy shop um, was to help um, me um, get ahead in my future. I am where I am today directly because um, of um, toy, um, that toy store, um, specifically um, because of certain toy trends that were going on um, in the early 1980s. So things like the Rubik's Cube, um, real crying baby dolls, all of these things were, um, were directly contributed to putting me where I am today. Um, the reason being, um, my grandmother started the toy store um, to basically help pay the um, school fees for my um, private school in the UK. So what you see here um, is sort of my life story from this toy shop that my grandmother started that enabled me to go to this exceptionally um, ridiculously fancy looking school called Haberdasher's Ask School for Boys. Um, if any of you are familiar with um, Alan Bennett's play, The History Boys, um, Haberdasher's gets a name check um, in there. It was also um, opened in the 1970s. Um, the school itself goes back to the 16th century because everything in England goes back to about then. Um, but uh, the school itself, um, this particular um, location was opened by Princess Margaret. Um, and I attended there in the 1980s, um, thanks to my grandmother. Um, the school encouraged me to apply to Cambridge, um, which I did. Um, there's a whole long story about that, but I got into Cambridge, which is the picture you see here in the top right. This is um, Gonville and Keyes College. Um, and I ended up getting into branding. I actually, after graduating from Keyes College, um, I ended up working for a bank. Um, and that wasn't exactly a great fit for me. Um, I lasted about four months um, working for NatWest on their graduate training program. And I applied for a job at a branding company um, that was advertising um, somebody to work in their naming department. And the reason I got an interview is because of this chap here, who is a gentleman by the name of Mark Bailey, who is the only person ever to play, um, or at the time was, I believe he still is, the only person ever to play rugby and cricket at the England national level. And I applied for this um, branding position. I think I was underqualified but the head of HR was a huge rugby and cricket fan. So when he saw Mark Bailey's name on my CV, on my resume as a reference, 
he couldn't pass up the opportunity to bring me in for an interview. So he could spend an hour on the phone talking to Mark Bailey. And apparently, um, Dr. Bailey told me they spent most of their time talking about his cricket and his rugby um, career um, during the reference check. Um, but on the basis of that, I was able to get a job um, working in branding, move banking into branding. And three years later, Interbrand, the branding company I was working for, got acquired by a um, uh, by WPP, um, actually by, acquired by Omnicom, sorry. And Omnicom um, transferred me from um, these beautiful offices. Actually, if you know Covent Garden, I worked in one of those arched windows right above Covent Garden tube station. Um, one of probably one of the best places in London to work. Um, incredible views. Um, and I got transferred um, to work in New York. So that's my story and how it all connects um, to a toy shop. Now, why on earth am I talking to you about toy shops and rugby and fancy private schools in Cambridge, apart from all of these things, um, obviously having a connection to England? Um, I could have just showed you um, my LinkedIn bio um, and you could have just checked that out or I could have told you um, my resume that I started working in branding in this company and then worked for that company. But ultimately, you would have forgotten that because stories are more powerful than facts. I guarantee that at the end of this presentation, most of you will remember some element of that story, whether it's my grandmother's toys store, the fact that I went to Cambridge, the rugby and cricket story. Stories help us remember and help us create a connection way more powerfully um, than facts. And what stories do is create connection. And it's exceptionally difficult for me right now. Um, it, for those of you that sort of have seen me present before, you know I love working um, with crowds and working with people in the room. And it's really difficult when I can't see people's faces and I'm just talking into a screen. Um, not even sure that anybody's actually watching or listening, but Stories help us create connection. And so one of the powerful things that we want to do um, when we connect stories and we tell stories is create connection with the people that, li that listen. Stories cross boundaries. Um, they cross um, digital boundaries. They cross physical boundaries. And we can all see similarities and sort of realize shared experiences. And Pixar and Disney um, are probably the best examples of um, modern day storytellers. You know, they are the, the storytellers who keep us entertained around our um, 21st century um, fire pits um, in the evening. And so as you think about storytelling and you think about stories, just take a minute and this is where you can go into the Q&A um, section. And uh, I'd love to see if you were a character in a Pixar or a Disney movie, who would you be and why? So you can see we've put some um, we've put some characters um, up here from various um, Pixar Disney movies. Hopefully, um, everybody sort of will will remember um, some character or somebody from um, Pixar or Disney. But I'd love to know um, as we talk about storytelling and think about characters and stories. Um, if you were a character in a Pixar or Disney movie, who would you be um, and why? So I'll let uh, I'll let you. Um, type in um, or answer some of those questions if, if you can um, type those into the um, the q a or the the chat section that'll be great okay any anybody wanting to share So we have a uh, um, we have a, a, a Nemo. Um, the the so so either somebody considers themselves a uh, a lost innocent or a bold um, adventurer overcoming all ad odds, um, modest gentle giant Shrek like that. Um, any other suggestions? Yeah, this is just a little warm up. So. Um, just just if, if okay there we go we've got no nemo um again the designer of the incredibles it's a it's a it is a difficult one um it's uh it's uh it's, it's not the easiest um particularly if you don't know um all the characters but um if you you know i i 
assumed that I would always get asked sort of, well, who do you think you would be? Um, that's what people usually would sort of be yelling at me if I was doing this in a crowded room. So I sort of identify with um, Remy the Rat um, from Ratatouille. Um, I don't know if you know that movie. If you don't, it is a phenomenal movie, not just for kids. Um, it's one of the, 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 the sort of the greatest animated movies I think ever made. But Remy the Rat um, is creative. Um, he loves cooking and exploring and becoming a chef. He's passionate, he's determined to fulfill his dream of, 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 of cooking. At the same time, he is very professional, very, has very high standards. And um, as my sort of colleagues at OGIS will say, he's also a little bit controlling in that he sits under the hat um, of um, oh, the guy's name I'm now forgetting. Um, and he controls sort of underneath the hat all the cooking that's going on. And so, um, you know, the thing about characters and the thing about stories, what makes them interesting is not just when they're all about perfection, but also when there are flaws, um, when there are challenges. Um, we want to talk about story and we'll come back to talking about um, Pixar and storytelling in a minute. But I know that um, when you think about story, one of the first things to think about is, well, let's start our story. Our story begins in you know, 1920, and then we opened this, and then we launched this program, and then we opened these branches. And the story isn't necessarily the same um, as your history, um, as your timeline. Your timeline is a series of facts. This is the Lego timeline. Um, it gives you a sense of the milestones um, in the organization's history, just in the same way that I could tell you in 1995, I moved to New York in 1991, I graduated from university in 19... You know, we can go through a timeline, but the story captures your imagination, captures you more, your attention. And I just want to demonstrate this with Lego. This tells you about Lego's history, but if you really want to know what the Lego brand stands for, um, we should watch... My name's video. Kitty Short, and I do and Lego therapy the in video. care homes for the elderly and people with Alzheimer's and dementia. That's a little bit of exercise. They don't get to go to the gym or go for a run. Lego's an exercise of the mind, which is better than anything. It's challenging the brain. Mm. Think, think hard and... Yeah, when that mind's getting exercised, serotonin is released and they're happy as Larry. I'm having a giggle and a laugh. <laughs> I'd always taught Lego therapy at schools. So I thought, well, how can I transfer the skills that I've got with elderly residents and people with dementia and Alzheimer's. So I went to a local residential home. We ended up after about three tries and it was a moment I thought, right, this works. So you've got a builder, a supplier, an engineer. So, so I'm not going to play the whole video, um, but it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a powerful video talking about um, Lego therapy. And you get more of a sense of what Lego stands for, what the Lego brand stands for from this video, something that is happening today, than you do, I think, from looking at um, the history of Lego. The history of Lego tells me about the facts, but this tells me that this is a brand that's all about play, that's all about creativity, that's all about imagination, that's about broadening um, people's minds, that's about bringing people together that's about creating magical um, moments through creativity and through play. So I've got much more as, of a sense of what the brand stands for. And I think that's one of the things to think about as we think about um, the 100 stories for 100 years that we're collecting for ESU. We don't just wanna tell stories that say, first this happened, then this happened, and then that happened, and that's our narrative sort of timeline. Um, we wanna tell stories that really give us an insight into what the brand, what your branch, or what ESU is all about to you. Um, and so your, your stories um, are going to be incredibly powerful um, like that. And sometimes they come from um, unexpected places. Again, Lego is a brand that most people associate with children, but here using older people's experiences with Lego really gives us an insight um, into what the brand is all about. Um, and for those of you that were struggling to understand the accent um, in that video, um, it's a broad Yorkshire accent, um, which is actually where my um, grandmother's toy shop was in Leeds, uh, which is in York. My name's okay. Kitty Short and I do Lego. Um, the other thing to point out about stories is that they are timeless. 
Um, I'm showing two videos um, playing here. The top video is one of the first ever um, moving picture videos ever captured. Um, in 1899, Louis Lumiere filmed somebody, I think it was his daughter or niece, um, feeding a cat. And then you fast forward um, over 120 years and guess what people are still watching? Videos of people feeding cats. Now, this one has 3.8 million views. There's something obviously about feeding cats um, that captures the imagination. Um, but it just goes to show that, you know, stories are incredibly powerful and strong stories um, are timeless. They, they, they will endure, they will last um, throughout the ages. So we'll leave the, we'll leave the cats here. Um, and we'll also talk about now why stories um, are also powerful, is that stories are made to be shared. Um, information is made to be sort of retained. Facts we retain, um, if we're lucky. But stories, when we hear a great story, we want to share it. Um, and there's an, a recent example of this um, that you, you may have seen if you read the New York Times um, recently. Um, there is a um, photographer um, called Brandon, and I always forget his second name, um, but he created a, um, a social media account, a project called Humans of New York, where he takes pictures of people, um, started off just people he would see randomly in New York. He's now done it around the world. And along with the picture, he just asked them to share the story, share a little bit of their story. And he told the story of um, this woman called Stephanie Johnson. This is, this is only about two or three weeks ago. Um, and uh, he took her picture, shared her story. And in over just over a week, they raised over two and a half million dollars um, for this woman um, because she was going through tough times on the basis of her incredible story. If you have not, if you're not familiar with the story, um, I encourage you to look up Humans of New York. Um, I warn you, there are some R-rated sections of the story. It's kind of got everything um, everything that you would uh, everything that you would expect from um, a woman who sort of um, worked as a burlesque dancer in Times Square in the 1970s um, but it's an incredibly powerful story that just connected with so many people who even in these times where you know we, we're all dealing with um, sort of austerity and being financially pressed she, they were able to raise over two and a half million dollars for her and over 140,000 shares um, of these posts in the course of a single week. So stories, when they're powerful, when they connect, when they're timeless and enduring, they have a life that sort of extends because they get shared and other people share them. The other thing that stories do is that they inspire people um, to take action. Um, and again, you know, just a, a, a recent example, Greta Thunberg went in the space of a year from being a schoolgirl who was taking Fridays off to protest on her own outside um, Swedish parliament to a year later leading the largest global um, climate strike ever. Why? Because she had an, she, her story itself was incredibly powerful and it engaged and captured people's imaginations. It wasn't as if we didn't know that there was an issue with climate change before the summer of 2018. Um, we did, but it was took the story of a single um, schoolgirl and the steps that she was taking to inspire millions of people around the world to take action. So again, as we think of stories, think about stories, not just let me get the facts out and lay them out. We're not necessarily writing a legal brief here or a purely historical document. We want to share stories that inspire people. We want to make story, tell stories that people will want to share. Um, and we want to tell stories um, that are timeless and enduring. This um, thing that I'm going to share with you right now, I'm going to play it. Hold on, um, as I as I talk, it's just an example that stories don't have to be complicated. This was a ad that um, McDonald's ran um, back in um, a few years ago during the Oscars, um, and essentially they just summed up um, a bunch of different movies um, in sort of ten words or less. And these are all two to three hour um, movies summed up in 10 or 12 words. Not even that, sometimes, you know, shower and hotel and long, three words to sum up the plot. 
lot of FICO. The stories can be very, very simple. Now we get, of course, to the McDonald's bit. It's got nothing to do with movies, nothing to do with Oscars. Um, so we'll leave um, it, it, it there. But again, the point is a story doesn't have to be complicated. Sometimes just a very simple, beautiful, elegant story um, can be more powerful than something that's like overly, overly complicated. Um, we asked you earlier to sort of share um, your Pixar character, who you thought Pixar was, and I said Pixar would be important. Uh, Pixar is important for storytelling because they just have a really simple formula. If you're sitting there thinking, well, how do I tell my story or how do I get into my story or what's a good way to share my story? Um, they have a super, super simple formula, um, which basically looks like this. Um, there's sort of five, six prompts. Once upon a time, there was blank, every day blank, one day blank. You can see the formula here. Best to show it actually in action to show you how it actually works. So um, this story should be familiar um, to most people. Once upon a time, there was a young orphan called Harry. Every day he lived under the stairs and was bullied by his aunt and uncle. One day he received an invitation to study at a special school for wizards. Because of that, he learned that his parents were killed by a dark wizard. Because of that, he had to protect himself and his friends from those dark forces until finally he defeated the evil wizard and save the school. So what took JK Rowling um, probably about 10 years and thousands and thousands of pages of text, we can sum up in six um, very simple um, prompts. Um, and we can do this for any story, any film, um, any book, any play, um, pretty much that has ever been um, produced. Um, so this one should be um, fairly straightforward. I'm not going to sing it, um, but, you know, free-spirited postulant called Maria. Every day. Can you hear me? I just got a notification. There. Um, the, one day she left the Abbey to work as the governess for a large family. Because of that, she's able to share her love of music with the children. Because of that, the father grows closer to her and his children until finally, She's able to use music to save the family from the Nazis and dance on the top of the mountains um, as she looks into Switzerland. Um, geographically incorrect, I believe, um, from, what I, from, from everything you see in the story, but it's a great story. Um, and we can do that for any story. You can pick any story here um, and, um, and, and, and tell, um, tell the story. Um, with those simple prompts. And so as you think about it, um, and I don't think we're going to um, do that exercise um, right now, but we could take, uh, you know, King Kong, once upon a time, there was a whatever, once upon a time, um, and it works, that, that formula works um, because essentially you have all the ingredients um, of the story. You have character. So who's this story about? Now, as you think about your ESU story, um, the story obviously could be about you. Those are probably the best, most personal stories, but it could also be about somebody you know, or it could be about somebody who you think, you know what, the person we gave this scholarship to, or this teacher who was part of ESU, or this child we sent to um, the Shakespeare competition, um, they must have a great story. Let's reach out to them and ask them for their story. But who's the character in the story? For most cases, um, a good starting point, obviously, is to make you the center of the story. And again, that's very different than writing a history of an organization or a history of a branch, because in that kind of... Um, in that... Keep getting notifications of my microphone switching off. In that kind of scenario, um, the um, you know the organization becomes the character, um, and we don't necessarily relate and connect as strongly to abstract concepts like an organization or a brand as we do to an individual or a person. So, who's a character in your story? What's the setup? What situation did you find yourself in? Or what situation did this person find themselves in um, that, that was just the sort of the everyday, their everyday situation? 
And then what was the conflict or the problem? Now, it doesn't have to be a conflict or a problem. It could also be an opportunity. Um, but in many cases, it will be a conflict or a problem. I moved to a new town and I didn't know anybody. I was looking for a way to make Shakespeare more exciting to my students. I realized that, you know, that the, the, the quality of like discourse in civil society was breaking down because people weren't able to communicate effectively. Whatever the story is or what the problem is, that becomes the heart um, of your story. And it's that conflict or that problem or that opportunity or that journey or that quest that sets the plot off. So some things are going to happen as a result of that. Because I moved to a new town and didn't know anybody, I was looking for organizations to become associated with and I came across ESU. Or because I you know, wanted to improve my ability to relate Shakespeare to modern students, I realized that I needed to go study new techniques of teaching Shakespeare. Whatever those stories are, um, actions are taken. And then finally, um, you know, there's going to be some positive outcome. What we want to do with the, with the stories that we have is have, what was the outcome of it? What was the outcome of this person's interaction or engagement or connection um, to ESU? And we want that to be um, obviously a positive outcome. There's some sort of resolution. Um, redemption may be, um, may be too powerful um, for what we're talking about here, but certainly resolution, um, renewal, the problem solved, the opportunity is seized. And this is a framework, a way of thinking um, about stories. Um, so hopefully this sort of sets you up um, as we start thinking about collecting um, 100 stories um, for um, 100 years. Um, it's a great opportunity to really capture the best of what makes um, ESU such a unique organization. You have so many incredible stories from the past, and we probably could just go look through the archives, um, tap into the organizational sort of institutional memory, um, and come up with 100 stories from the past. But that's, again, not just what we want to do. This isn't just about 100 stories from the past and sort of looking at what happened. We, you are creating as an organization um, new stories um, every day from the people who participate in your programs um, to yourselves. Um, you know, how has ESU helped you and has Happy Hour um, helping you get through, um, you know, the current pandemic? Um, and, you know, how will it help? Um, how did it help during lockdown? You know, there are so many um, new stories that are being created. Um, and a lot of those stories may be digital, but again, even thinking about, as I say, like Arnick or the Lord Moore scholarships or the middle school debate, these are stories um, that you're creating that may not have a central figure as famous as sort of Cary Grant or the Queen Mother or Alistair Cook, but they're still equally powerful stories. And, you know, arguably we could connect and relate to these stories because they are about, about real people like us. Um, perhaps more powerfully than a, the, 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 than a celebrity. Um, collecting stories isn't just about sort of um, gathering stories for, um, you know, for posterity and preserving. Um, we're not just creating something to sort of set um, and put in a book and forget about it, put it on a bookshelf. Um, these stories um, are gonna help you um, in your communications and in your um, efforts over the next um, year to remain connected um, to your current members, to help reach out um, and engage with um, potential new members. Um, because again, people will understand what the organization's about by reading um, or sharing or listening to or viewing these stories. And these stories can be, um, you know, printed in publications like collected together in a book. They can feature on your website and in social media. Um, and when they're on the website and social media, they can obviously be just written down with a photograph, but they can also be um, video um, and they can be audio so that people can hear the voices of the people telling um, the, the, the stories. Um, stories can help inspire um, events. You know, we may find we have a uh, collection of really powerful, really great stories where we want to do a um, moth type um, virtual event, or even when we're all able to get together in person again, 
have in-person events where we invite people to share their stories. Um, if you're not familiar with the Moth, it's a great organization that's done amazing things around um, storytelling. They've, they have, I think, a weekly show um, still on NPR. But there's no reason why um, the ESU couldn't have its own um, moth type um, events to engage people um, with storytelling. And obviously, um, these stories can be included in newsletters and in other communications, again, printed newsletters um, and um, electronic newsletters. So stories aren't just around, let's grab all these stories and put them in a book. They provide a reason for us to reach out and connect and share ideas and celebrate what makes ESU so special over the course, um, not just of, um, of the coming year, but if we do this right, you know, storytelling can become part of the DNA um, of the organization. So um, I'm gonna ask you now um, to um, think about um, what your story um, would be. Um, think about the story that you would like to share um, with ESU. Um, and I know I didn't get a lot of people participating in my um, Pixar um, question earlier. Um, and some people said, I don't know anybody from Pixar. I don't know anybody from um, Disney, but everybody knows um, the, 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 the stories. Everybody here knows ESU. So I ask you, and if we were able to sort of, uh, if, if anybody wants to raise their hand, um, and share their story. Um, just um, just raise your hands. Um, sort of again, type in the Q and A, um, and we'll add you to the panel. And we'll just invite you to tell um, uh, your short um, ESU story. Um, and again, if this helps, we can you can use this format. But uh, don't feel that we have to um, use this format. This is just again sort of what's the what how how has ESU helped or impacted um, your lives. So we did have someone with their hand up. So I invited Susan Sinclair as a panelist. Oh, me? <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Well, I appreciate it. Okay. Um, all right. Once upon a time, there was a little girl from Nashville. Um, and she got invited to come to a couple of dinners at uh, this weird organization that sounded like you needed to speak English. And she sort of did with a very thick Southern accent. And um, then she somehow ended up on the uh, getting involved and Anne Calhoun kept getting her into deeper and deeper. And because of that, uh, using the Pixar template, uh, she ended up uh, thinking, oh, I'll come to a couple of dinners. It'll be a piece of cake. And then all of a sudden she was on the national board and dealing with all kinds of fun things. Uh, and then she gets asked by um, this uh, strange English guy to make a video about her story. I, I have no idea how that happened. One questions whether it ends in redemption or not. Uh, it, it, it absolutely does, because you redeemed me from the, 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 the torture of a, of, a, of a tumbleweed blowing across a a Zoom screen as everyone sits silently refusing to engage. Um, so thank you. It, it, it absolutely um, it, it ends in redemption. Um, All right, and we have someone else who would like to tell their story. Josh. She's, uh, we're, I'm just getting her to unmute right now. So Sylvia Bruton, um, if you can turn on your video and unmute yourself. You are now in the panelist section. All right, video's there. You unmute. And Is that there you're unmuted, perfect. Ah, 
I saw, yeah. Well, yes. Um, I have many, many stories about the English speaking union. And so I won't keep you a long time, but my husband and I for years, well, in the uh, 60s, when we first met, he was a member of this organization called the English speaking union. And God knows I was quite busy and had no time for things like that. But he insisted that it was a wonderful organization because he had been selected in the 1940s, actually 1948, he was selected to be a scholar, a national English speaking union scholar who was sent to England to study at a boys school called Christ's Hospital. And he would have been an exchange student and therefore a student there at CH or Christ Hospital would have then come to America and spend a year. So he spent a year there at CH and the boy came here. It was a school founded um, by the son of Henry VIII, Edward VI. And it was an incredible school for poor boys. And so he went there for a year and he said that it was the most significant year of his life. And having gone to both Princeton undergraduate and Harvard Law School, he said, he learned more there than he did up into his second year at, at Yale, I mean, at, uh, at Harvard. Um, it was quite a compliment, but it made a real difference. And so he insisted that I get involved in it. And I ended up being president of the English speaking union, Kentucky branch for many years. And one of the things that we've done for years I is to send you. students over to study in England. Mm -hmm. And it has made such a difference. So we would also go in the summertime and join our students in England and we would send them. Uh, they had a choice of going to Oxford, Cambridge or Edinburgh. And most went to Cambridge where we went in the summer times and studied all sorts of wonderful subjects. One time I remember we had about six students there and we decided that day we were going to uh, go on a, on a, on a trip. And uh, so I ended up renting a, a van and we took our students uh, to Canterbury and spent the day and they had a wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, so it has made such a difference. And in doing so through these years, I met a wonderful teacher because we also sent teachers over to England to study at the Globe Theater found a wonderful woman that I said, she was a teacher, very enthusiastic and energetic. And I said, you really need to apply to the, for this scholarship for teachers. And so she did. Well, that is our current president, Kate Nitzkin. She came back and said, my life has totally changed. I don't teach the same way now. I don't live, I don't think the same way. Everything in my life has changed as a result of my being there and I wanna get involved. And boy, did I have a position for her because I'd been a president for a long, long time. And so that's my story. We've had wonderful relationships through the years. And my husband's brother who lives in Mexico City, it used to be that Mexico would send uh, their winner. They got involved because, through us um, in being in, encouraged to have a Shakespeare competition in Mexico so they would send their, Shake, their Shakespearean winner up to uh, New York just to perform because they couldn't, of course, participate. But um, we also started a small English speaking union branch in Mexico City and were invited there when they had their, um, their opening. And it was a wonderful experience. So we felt that we have been such an important part of the English speaking union and it has such a, made such a difference in our lives. That's a phenomenal. So what I love about the, 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 the story, Sylvia, is the his, and this is very, very often what happens when you start telling stories. There's it's a, a very what? There's a historical, like what happened we, for your husband, that, that analogy, the, the lives that you've continued to impact through the teachers and through the children yes. and that you've continued to, to send. It's not just a story about one person. You see how that story continues to repeat and the themes and the ideas carry on down the generations. And it just, 
it just shows the responsibility, I think, and the and the 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 the, the relevance of this organization. That yes, the 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 membership um, um, may be aging, but the 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 relevance of this organization, the work that you do, that that it could has never been um, more relevant. And the stories that we tell in the past can inform um, and engage and inspire um, the future. That's true. Um, and that's what we want to do. So we don't want, we don't want, you know, um, we don't just want sort of young people picking up a centenary book about ESU and saying, who are these sort of like black and white pictures of? I don't know who any of these people are. They can see themselves and see their stories um, and they'd be able to see themselves in the stories that are told. And that's phenomenal. Um, I think we have a couple of other people um, queued up um, right, Josh, so... Um, yes, so uh, Pauline Perkins was next. Pauline, whenever you're ready. You. Okay. Thank you. Well, I don't so much have a story to tell, um, but I have been thinking for a long time that I would like to write a sort of story of my life to leave for my children, because there's a lot about it that they don't really, really know. And listening to you has inspired me because you have set forward the sections that you need to go from one to the other. And it's I, I, I just sort of eager to get started because now I have some idea of how to, how I should put it together. So, uh, and I, I grew up in England in wartime and came to America as a teenager. And uh, you can imagine that was quite a, a shock because uh, life was you know, very, very, very different between my early years and in my later teenage years. And uh, uh, life has moved me through different places to be and many different people to be involved with. And, uh, you know, but I, I just sit, I couldn't just sort of sitting there say, well, this and this and this didn't make sense. But now you have given me uh, premise to work from. And so I just want to say thank you very much. I'm so glad I was listening to this today. Thank you. Oh, it's, it's, it's our pleasure. And obviously, the, the one thing I would say as you, as you, as you sort of work on your story and, and sort of yeah. think, think about your story is the fact that you're here today means ESU um, has played somewhat of a role um, in your life. So as you get to that section of your, of your story and as you start thinking about it, um, maybe that becomes just a, a small section um, of the story that you can share. But as you look at sort of why it's important to you and what it's um, wh wh why you're still involved, um, it's worth asking those those questions. Like why why are you here? What is the what is the value um, in the organisation? So again, we don't need to answer that now because I know we've, yeah. we've we've got time. We're running out yeah. of time, and we've got um, Jeff has a story to share as well. But again. Everyone who's here, everyone who's here on this call has a has a will will have a story to tell because they're you know we're, you're you you could be doing some anything else on a Monday mm -hmm. afternoon, um, but you're here, um, you're spending your time online listening to me witter on, um, and so then you must have a story, you must have a connection for um, for uh, with, with ESU. So Pauline, thanks a lot. I look forward to reading your story when it's when it gets published. <laughs> or seeing the movie. <laughs> Yes. Jeff. All right. And uh, finally, Jeff Schnabel from the Kansas City branch. Jeff, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. Um, well, this is a story uh, about the Kansas City branch, which uh, also is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. Um, this is a story that goes way back years before I joined the ESU. Uh, some 36 years ago, back in 1984, the Kansas City branch was a major benefactor and patron to help fund a permanent bronze statue of Winston and Clementine Churchill in a very prominent location in Kansas City. Hmm. The statue was designed by British sculptor Oscar Nerman, who oh. had he had created several Churchill works. The, the sculpture uh, titled Married Love is six feet by 12 feet and is the larger version 
of the original that is actually at Blenheim Palace in Oxfordshire, England, where Churchill was born and later proposed to Clementine. The, uh, the Kansas City branch held a major fundraising for the sculpture and arranged a live theatrical production about Churchill's life to spark interest in the sculpture. The production was titled Churchill and it played for one evening only on November the 28th, 1982. The benefit performance raised funds needed to complete and maintain the $250,000 sculpture, which was dedicated on May the 12th, 1984 with Churchill's granddaughter, Edwina Sandys and the Duke of Marlborough in attendance. So that was a remarkable story, I thought. It's an incredible story. Um, I think it's the first, again, just the, the, the connections that you, we, we make between Kansas City and Blenheim Palace. Um, <laughs> I've been to both places um, and I, I, it wasn't like I was like, oh, this reminds me of, you know, <laughs> you know. so the, the, the connections that you have there are incredible. And um, if you haven't already planned to do it, you should absolutely be looking to do um, a centennial performance, a centenary performance um, of that show. If you still have the, if you still have the script or the, the, <laughs> the works for it, it's, uh, You've got till November eighth, twenty twenty two, and uh, I'll. Uh, I don't have a cigar prop to audition for it now, but uh, let me know when you when you when you put the 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 auditions up for the, uh, for, for for the play. I mean, this is this is what happens when we start sharing stories. We start uncovering connections um, that we didn't knew um, existed. We start discovering opportunities um, that perhaps we didn't know um, existed. And I think if for, for all of these stories, um, you know, we can look at these stories and say, well, how does this story start to um, expand minds? You know, Susan starts off going to a dinner party and ends up being president of a, you know, of a, of a branch, um, you know, uh, Jeff shares the story of you know the the centenary the the, the product this one one once in a lifetime sort of one off um, performance of a production that maybe there's an opportunity to resurrect or revisit that for it you know a hundred years on stories um, shouldn't just be about sharing the facts and communicating the facts I think if you look through the stories that you're trying to tell and say is there a theme in what ESU does? We worked so hard to get to this definition, sort of this brand um, idea of ESU for expanding minds, strengthening friendships and unlocking opportunities. I think you'll find every story that you tell, if you go back to your story. So first of all, just take the time to put the story down on paper. Or if you don't want to put it down on paper, just record it. Um, just, um, you know, ju ju just sort of sit with a phone and sort of record it into the phone. Um, and then go back and look at it um, again and say, okay, is there anything in here that really talks to one of these three things? Or unlocking opportunities. And if, this, if you can find that, that, that idea or that theme, then I think you can um, sort of dig a little deeper into that area because that's what's really gonna make these stories um, so much more powerful. Um, the other thing that I would say is um, you'll have great stories to tell, but um, there have to be at least three other people you know um, who have a great um, ESU um, story that they would want to tell. So whether that's one of the students um, who has participated in a Shakespeare program or a middle school debate, or whether it is one of the teachers um, who's um, gone to study in Cambridge or Oxford or Edinburgh um, or Stratford-on-Avon, whether it's somebody who came to do a speaker tour of the US and met people on there, whether it is a pen pal, somebody that you correspond with in the past, 
reach out to them and let them know what ESU is doing. Let them know um, that we are um, collecting these stories and invite them to tell their story. And they can either write their story down um, or they can, um, you know, they can record it on their phone and share it with us. Or they can go on a Zoom call. We can set up a Zoom call and we can record the, on a Zoom call. And here are just some story prompts um, that you could share with other people or that for those of you that didn't share your stories today, um, that uh, the, the, these prompts will give you ideas for sharing stories. How did you first get involved with ESU and why? Um, it's, you know, it, it's never just as simple as I just showed up to, um, to a always, uh, you know, there was something going on that made you go to that dinner um, and that, that sort of made that dinner um, versus staying at home. What's your most memorable experience um, of ESU? What's the, what's the event or the activity or the person that you've met or the opportunity or the trip that is most memorable that will always be your defining ESU moment? Is there somebody you've met um, in your life through ESU? Um, how did you meet them and why are they important? And how's ESU impacted your professional and or your personal life? So these are questions that, you know, hopefully will inspire you to share stories and feel free to, to sort of send these questions to um, two or three other people and invite them to share the, their stories. If we get more than a hundred stories, it doesn't matter. The more stories we get, the better, because as I say, these stories will become sort of a bedrock on which we can build communications and connect with people, and particularly when we're unable to do so in person. So um, that is, um, that, that, that's what, what, what I wanted to talk to you about today, about storytelling. I wanna share um, a video um, with you to close, um, just to again, sort of, if you haven't got the message already about how important storytelling is, um, this is uh, to let you know. Dive in. Dive in! Bah, j'étais embarqué dans un camion de livraison et voilà comment j'ai atterri ici. <rire> c'est incroyable. Hein. Hein, T'en penses ça, chérie bah Oui, c'est fou. So, so I encourage you all to, to share your stories. Like I said, they're made to be shared. They create emotional connection. They're timeless and enduring, um, just like ESU. And thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Really appreciate it. Anyway, thank you very much, Martin. Um, and I think that was very inspiring. And the story at the end was perfect. It sounds like a day in the life. Um, but um, I think it was very funny and very inspiring. So I think this is sort of a, an introduction to all of you as we move into the centennial year that we're gonna keep collecting these stories and, and we don't want you to stop. And um, sometimes when you feel as if you're not connecting with your members, maybe this is a vehicle where you could establish things or you can start connecting with your members. Um, so I think that we've had a lot to think about and um, I think it's been an excellent kind of way to launch the week, um, very inspiring and very engaging. So tomorrow, I will see you all, unless you're a part of our international community, I will see you all tomorrow at 1130. Um, and, uh, and we will hear a, an address by the English Speaking Union of the Commonwealth, uh, Jane Easton and James Raven, which should be very inspiring. And then I think we're going to be doing some breakout sessions with the branches. So thank you very much for the first day. And, um, 
as we said, we're exploring new territory here. So um, I think we'll all have stories to tell after this week too. Anyway, have a lovely evening, everybody. And thank you. And thank you, Martin, again. Our pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Hope to see you in person. <laughs>